What's up YouTube? Welcome to this video on I disposables or dispose exposed. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a few things. I'm going to be talking about the, the why, when and how of disposables. That means going down to the details of the, the runtime, jitter, this other thing like that. Not too detailed, but just so that people have an understanding of why the heck is there such a thing as a dispose, especially when we are in a managed language like .NET C Sharp. And then with lots of code examples, with code that is going to be modified in this video, so you understand what it looks like before we fix it up, and then we fix it up. The fixed code will be on my GitHub, so the link for that code or source code will be in the description below. But in this video, you're going to see that process occur, so you understand the thinking and reasoning behind when certain things are done and when they're not done, or why they're done and how they're done. And there's going to be various examples from just a standard C Sharp class to uh, worker services, background services, AD.NET, and uh, yes, and in conjunction with the DI container that we get available in .NET, especially in ASP.NET. So how to work with all of this together in, in one project, if you will, and uh, you're going to see it all happen, so hopefully that'll help you understand the reasoning for why things are, right? So, and there'll be chapter markers, so you can skip through or go back to certain areas if you get confused or want to re-watch it again, all right? Okay, so without further ado, let's get going. All right, what we have here, okay, let me just go on the pointer, okay. Imagine the gray area here, all of this, to be your operating system. And in this operating system, you are running a .NET application, which is here. Let's assume this is a console application, just to keep things simple here. And so there's an executable or a .exe file that you have double clicked on to run that. When that application runs, it runs in what is known as an app domain, which is this green box here. So all .NET applications run in a singular app domain. If the same executable, the same exe file, is double clicked again to run on a second instance, they are completely different app domains, right? So the screen box that you're seeing here, this pertains to one instance of the application running. If there's another instance on the same machine running as a second instance, then you will find there will be two completely different app domains for that same application. And that's important to grasp, just from understanding how .NET works. It plays a big role in ASP.NET applications where, by default, your application will run as multiple app domains. So it's not quite obvious. You don't necessarily understand that, that to be the case. In fact, you are completely oblivious of it. But that's what happens. But nonetheless, over here for a console application, if you double-click the XE a second time and you see two different console windows running on the same machine, they are two different app domains, right? Each app domain has the following. You get your own global heap with this app domain. You get your garbage collector. You get the JIT compiler. You get some marshalling services. And I'll go a little deeper on marching services, not that it actually matters, but because that sort of drives the reason for why we have this disposable thing in the first place, all right? So I won't go into the details of global heap, JIT compiler, garbage collector. I just want to give you that visual representation of your app domain and your application, and that all this comes for the right, the managed part of .NET. What does managed mean? Well, it's managing the garbage collection. It's managing the JIT compilation or compiling essentially your IL or your intermediate language or MSIL, <laughs> Microsoft intermediate language, to native code on the hardware that you're running. So if you're running on a 64-bit machine, it'll compile it, JIT compile it, just in time compile it based on the hardware, the CPU architecture, and so on and so forth to give you the most optimal native code. But the runtime is dependent on the operating system. So the whole gray area you see on the slider, this is the operating system, right? And this thing happens to be running in the operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac OS. At this point, it doesn't make much of a difference. And there are services. Let me just move on to the next slide. There are services that the operating system provides you with. That means the runtime is not self-sufficient. It depends on your operating system and some of the services, the operating system provides any application, whether it's a native application or a managed application, those services available to us 
as programmers, we happen to be programming .NET C Sharp, and so we run within a managed environment. So the managed environment, the runtime, the .CLR, is interfacing or interacting with the operating system to get some of these resources, such as TCP sockets, UDP sockets. So anytime you are connecting to services using HTTP client, talking to your database or Azure services or remote anything remote services using TCP, whether it's HTTP or FTP or whatever other protocol or UDP, it's using sockets that are provided to your application via the operating systems management of those sockets. So this is unmanaged. You're sitting in a managed environment here and all that you create here directly, your own .NET classes that don't work with anything that is unmanaged will sit here, run here, will be allocated here and will be garbage collected here. But when you use unmanaged resources, now you don't necessarily know that you're doing that because if you didn't build a class that actually works with a, the Windows API, for example, does, you know, P invoke or anything of that nature of your own, you don't necessarily understand that to be the case. But if you're using, say, HTTP client or file system or UI graphics, fonts, other graphics, bitmaps, images, you know, of that, that kind, if you're using name pipes directly or indirectly, unless you're working with ADO.NET and SQL Server using name pipes or TCP, you just need to be aware that there are certain things that are being used within the, the classes or classes that use other classes that use other classes. Somewhere in that call chain, if any one of these things exist, then it is unmanaged code, meaning there is something that has gone beyond the realm of your app domain. So it's no longer managed. So you still have access to it, but because it's unmanaged, the garbage collector doesn't know about it. It cannot collect the garbage. It never allocated anything for that thing that's outside of the app domain. So it doesn't know it exists. But you know, or you're supposed to know, and so it becomes your responsibility to clean it up. If you don't, you're going to start leaking memory or you're going to start running out of sockets and so on and so forth. Bad things happen. So at a high level, if the code you are writing indirectly uses something that is unmanaged, you need to dispose. All right. Now in .NET, just like we have constructors, we have finalizers or destructors. And I'll, I think I'll talk about this finalize thing later on, but just keep in mind the you could be using finalizers for the purposes of disposing something, but there is a bit of a nuance there. And so we have I disposable. Okay. So I hope you understand just this idea that if you're using unmanaged resources directly or indirectly from your application, from classes that you have. So the, the question becomes, how do you know, right? That you are responsible. Well, if the class you're using, any class you're using has a dispose method on it, you must call it. It's simple like that. However, the question still becomes, when do you call it? How do you call it? Because it's not always that clear. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video, giving you different examples and scenarios so that you understand exactly what is required of you if you're using a class that is I disposable. All right. Okay. So I will get to that finalizer thing at a later point when you see the actual code. I just want you to make sure you understand this aspect here. All of these things are unmanaged resources. They're within the operating systems realm. They're not within your managed code realm, your managed code of the GC. Sorry, GC here. It doesn't have a clue that this was allocated and thus needs to be disposed of or freed of. You know, if this uh, socket handle or a pipe handle or a file handle, graphics handle, et cetera, et cetera. This becomes your responsibility. So, if a class you're using for the first time, and that's what I do actually, honestly, that's what I do. If I'm using a class for the first time, the first thing I will check to see is, is it disposable? And if, if, I, if that class has a method on it that returns to me something else that I've never used before, I'll check if that is disposable and so on. So I do this as just something I need to uh, you know, do when I am introduced to a new class or a new library or something. Because that will inform me how I intend to use that class or should be using that class. Okay? So let's look at some code. 
I have here just a simple application. Essentially, this is a web API application. It's a standard, you know, the weather service thing. I've just modified it to include a controller. I'll remove the default controller. This is the original controller. And it's got some stuff here. Basically, I've got a get method that returns a collection of something called movie, which is a DTO, which is just a regular movie kind of class. You know, with title and year and stuff like that, genre. And then I got a domain layer project. This is a library project. And it's got sort of the meat of the application itself. And it's got a domain facade. Everything's as simple or bare minimum as possible. And the domain facade creates an instance of a manager. The manager requires a service locator. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it, but I just want to show you that there's a call chain involved. But when the domain facade gets created, it effectively creates an instance of a manager, which and the manager in turn takes an instance of the service locator. Right? So in fact this should not be a new instance, this should probably just be this instance. Right. Okay. It's created new here. Alright. So there's an instance of a service locator and so on. And eventually the manager then if you look at the manager here. To get all movies, it calls on the gateway. And the gateway, in this case, let's go into the gateway class itself. In order to get all movies, it uses HTTP client. And this is our friend HTTP client as part of the .NET framework. And HTTP client at this point was initialized in a method called create HTTP client. That is here. So this create HTTP client gives us an instance of an HTTP client. Now let's say you're using this for the very first time. You look at this HTTP client. You say, oh my gosh, there's a dispose method on this. So I need to dispose. Now with HTTP client and other things like DB connections and such, TCP connections, they are expensive. Generally speaking, you don't want to create an instance of a new thing that establishes a connection and disposes of the connection every request because that's going to kill your performance. So the same with the HTTP client, you don't end up creating a new instance each time. So in this case, this HTTP client is being maintained as a member of this gateway class. So when I call get all movies, I'm simply calling the get async method. I'm not creating a new instance and I'm not disposing it here. I've seen a lot of code for that uh, recommendations come through sample codes that say using HTTP client and so on and so forth. Don't do that here for the HTTP client you want to create an instance, one instance, for generally speaking, <laughs> for the lifetime of your application. But that becomes a different story. Just keep in mind here, the HTTP client is disposable. All right. This application actually works just fine. If I run it right now, let's run it. You should see some data appear in the browser. Give it a few seconds. There. So it's working, no problem at all. But well, there's no problem in the sense that it's working, but it's leaking. Or in time, will leak start to leak memory, not just for HP client, but there are many other things going on here. And it's going to start leaking memory. You don't necessarily know that. Okay, so I've seen HTTP client for the first time. I understand it's disposable, so I need to dispose of it. I understand that I cannot create an instance of a HTTP client for every request that I have to make. So I have to create an instance generally for the lifetime of the application. In this case, my gateway is being created by the manager. See, yeah, the gateway is created by the manager. It creates the gateway. And it maintains an instance of that gateway for its lifetime. The manager in turn is created by the domain facade. It's being created by the uh, maintained for the lifetime. So essentially, the whole chain is being retained for the lifetime of this domain facade. How long does this domain facade stay alive? In this particular case, the way I've done this is in the web application. In the startup, I've registered the domain facade as a singleton in the DI container. So there'll be one instance of the domain facade for the entire lifetime and all other instances across multiple, across the single app domain. One instance of a domain facade that will maintain one instance of the manager which will maintain one instance of the gateway, and the gateway maintains one instance of the HTTP client. But HTTP client, at some point, when you shut down or unwind, 
you have to dispose of it. You're not clear so far. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with that idea. So I know I, because the gateway is using something that should be disposed, HP client, then we call it, we have to cascade the disposable. So the, because the HP client is being used by the gateway, now the gateway needs to become I disposable, right? So because the gateway creates an instance of HP client, it becomes the gateway's responsibility to dispose of the HP client, but it doesn't know when it's going to get disposed, and so it starts to cascade this disposing. So what I'm going to do here in the gateway, I'm going to say this gateway implements I disposable. Okay, and when I do that, to implement the disposable, there is a pattern. It's called the dispose pattern. So this is the interface itself, and this would be just cool if you just did that. But the dispose pattern essentially says you want to call from this dispose method, the public method, which is part of the interface side disposable, you want to call a private method with a true argument, and I'll show you what that looks like. So to implement this, um, generate a method. And this private method, the bool argument is called uh, disposing. Can you just bear with me to like complete this? And this, so this, this public method, which is part of the interface, calls dispose true, and then it does a, a GC dot suppress finalize. This is part of the what we call a dispose pattern. If you don't do it like this, things are wrong. All right? I'll explain all of this stuff. Now here in the dispose, I'm going to say something like if disposing and generally and not dispose. And let's define this as a field and not disposed. Then do something here and eventually just say disposed equals true. Okay. And what do we do here in this? If it's disposing and it's not disposed, then the HTTP client can be disposed. Right? Now, you see how it is recommending. This is something another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> When it, when I do that, it's well. I don't know if you notice that it. We just do, okay. You see the house suggesting or recommending the question mark dot dispose. I don't like this idea. The question mark dot is null. Null conditional operator. Don't use it unless you really need to use it, and that, by that I mean is your what is your intent? So let me, what I, what I mean. What do I mean by that? And it seems to be, you know, it's safe. And just in case, let's make it put a question mark dot. And I'm saying don't use that. See, with, with programming with intent, you're supposed to make your intent clear, which also means you need to be clear. How can you make your intent clear if you are not clear yourself, right? <laughs> so what does that mean? Will this ever be null? Will this HTTP client ever be null? Let's look at that. In this case, in the constructor of the Gateway, we create an instance and we have an instance we have an instance of HTTP client in the constructor. All right, then that's fine. So as long as an instance has been created of HTTP gateway, sorry, this gateway, there will be an instance of HTTP client. There's no reason to put a question mark dot. I know this is, looks like a small thing, but this becomes really confusing in large systems because if everyone is just being safe. Nobody actually understands what is the expected behavior. By removing the, removing the question mark here, I'm saying, I know this is never going to be null. By the time it hits the dispose method here, it's not going to be null. So don't bother checking and verifying. It's not. If it is null, by the time it comes here, there's something else going on. But you need to fix some, some other area of the code. All right? So I dispose of the HP client here, and then I said dispose. To choose some, whether it's disposing or not, if it calls dispose. I'm just going to say dispose. It's true here. And that way it's already disposed. So that when, I, when it comes the next time, it's still set to true. Right? Some people say you can shoot put it in there. I don't see the difference because we don't, this will only be false as in who's calling this method disposed with a false. There's only one method that's calling and it's with a true. Right? And so let's talk about this aspect here. The GC suppress finalize and the dispose true. 
generally, if you have a constructor destructor or finalizer, from the finalizer, you will call the same dispose method with the false. Right? If you if you do implement a finalizer, then you would call the same dispose method, the private method, with a false argument. But you will not do a GC suppress finalize because it's already in the finalizer. Right? So what is this GC suppress finalize? It's a bit complicated, but let me try and keep it simple. The general guidance is to not use a finalizer unless you have to in your C sharp classes. Why? Because when you have a finalizer or a destructor specified for your classes, those classes are managed by the garbage collector in another special manner, you know, in a very special manner. They have a, what I call a free reachable or, or a, what some people would call F reachable. I call it free reachable queue. F reachable queue and manages those finalizer classes in a separate queue. As a result of that, what happens is when you dispose of your class, when the class can be disposed, it takes one additional, or one or two additional GC collections for the class to actually be disposed. In other words, the classes are getting disposed later than they could have. If you didn't have the finalize or destructor, the class would have been cleared up one or maybe two GC cycles earlier. So that's why they say don't bother using a finalizer just because, unless you really have to. Generally speaking, unless you're building a class that for whatever reason has to have a finalizer to manage its own resources that are unmanaged, you should not be using a finalizer. So you know, the alternative to that in .NET was to the disposable pattern saying, if you are hanging on to or holding on to something that is disposable, then implement the add dispose and dispose of it in this private dispose method that we have. From the public method, you call the private method and immediately call gc.suppress finalize. So you're really telling the GC that don't bother trying to finalize this class. I have taken care of it. And that's what gc.suppress finalize is doing. It's just telling the GC to don't bother fi calling finalize on this class. So remove it from that reachable, from that f reachable queue and be done with that. If you don't still get it, don't bother or don't worry about it. I mean, this pattern is called the dispose pattern. And all your dispose, every time you implement I disposable, you are going to have to implement something that effect. Now, the difference, of course, would be this part here, as in what do you need to dispose? And there could be one, two, or three things that your class needs to be disposing of here. In this case, the gateway has this HTTP client as the only thing that needs to be disposed. So the HTTP client is sort of the culprit, if you will. It's the one that is the disposable. It's okay, I, hey, I need to be disposed. And so that goes, the responsibility goes up to the, the gateway in this class, in this case, that class that we're in right now, the gateway. But because the, now the gateway is disposable, who created the gateway? The manager. <laughs> so now the manager needs to become an I disposable. The manager says, okay, then I'm going to have to become I disposable and I'm going to have to implement it. It's the same implementation, right? This public method will simply call, I'll just move this down here. What are we disposing here? In this case, for the manager, it needs to dispose the gateway since that's the one. It, it created the gateway that becomes responsible. The manager becomes responsible to dispose of the gateway because now the gateway is disposable. Right? So we do that. And again, do we need to use the question mark dot here? Well, the gateway is constructed in the constructor of the manager and so we don't have to worry about it ever being null. If you call dispose it, you were successfully constructed, which means the gateway is, has already been created. All right. So now that the gateway, sorry, the manager in this case has become I disposable, who's using the manager or who creates the manager? The domain facade. 
you look at the domain first, now it's the one creating the manager, so it's the one responsible for disposing of the manager, which means it now needs to be an I disposable. You see how this is it's called chaining, which is almost like, uh, what I say, you know, it's like a virus. It's, it's just creeping all over the place because of the um, HTTP client that was the culprit that started this whole chain reaction, if you will, right? It's kind of going up the chain, meaning the HTTP, HTTP client is quite a ways down or deep in the guts of the system. Okay, so let's do that as true. And here we need to dispose the manager. All right, so this whole chain, starting from the HTTP client that started this whole chain reaction, if you will, and made forced our hand to make this gateway disposable, that forced our hand to make the manager disposable, that forced our hand to make the domain facade disposable. All right? So if you were, say, in a console application, and you knew to have a domain facade to use it, and then you would have to dispose of it. Because it's an I disposable now. So if you were to use that class for the first time, you I said, just check if the class got the dispose method on it, call the dispose method on it. <laughs> so that's that. In this particular case, this is running in an ASP.NET application, and the domain facade has been registered with the IOC container, and the IOC container will manage the disposable things. So at, at the end of the, when you shut down your application, it's going to dispose of the domain facade, that's going to dispose of the manager, that's going to dispose of the gateway, that's going to dispose of the HTTP client, and all's good, right? You can confirm that's actually happening if you wanted to do that, and maybe I'll show you, if that's, show you that that's happening. But we have a few other things to do. So, so this is the first example of an HTTP client that's buried deep in the guts of the system somewhere, and how or why you cascade this I disposable up the call chain, right? Another example that's not part of this application, it's code, but is uh, available on my movie service. Code, I can shoot, put the link for that service as well. It's a much more full-fledged implementation or code base where I also have a database. I call it a data manager here that's using a SQL server and using ADA.NET directly. And I want to talk about this aspect here. If you look at this one, create movie method. That's the whole method in, in your screen now. So, creates a connection. This is a DB connection. ADA.NET DB connection. Opens the connection. Then begins the transaction. So now you have an instance of a transaction. This is where the transaction instance gets initialized, if you will, with the begin transaction. Then the create command initializes a DB command. So connection was created, connection was opened, then a transaction was inst instantiated, and instance wise it was started, but this way is an instance of a transaction, and an instance of a DB command was created. Then you do something in the event of an exception, you want to catch it, and then eventually or finally, no matter what happens, you close the connection. You dispose the command, you dispose the transaction, and you dispose the connection. And I want to talk about this whole thing here. So there's a few things. If you are using multiple things that need to be disposed, like here, you can see, you know, there's a command that needs to be disposed, the transaction needs to be disposed, connection needs to be disposed. I'm not using a using statement. I'm using a try finally here. One try finally where in the finally I dispose of all the things that need to be disposed, right? And there's another caveat here. Look at the order of creation. So this connection was created first, then the transaction, then the command. When you dispose, you dispose them in the reverse order. Dispose the command first, then dispose the transaction, and then dispose the connection. So this is almost like a, what is the last in first order? It's like you're popping off the stack, right? 
So when you, as you create in one order A, B, C, you dispose in the reverse order C, B, A, right? And if, if there's more than one thing that needs to be disposed, then you just use a try finally. In the new language version, I think eight onwards, we have the using declaration. It's not a using statement, it's using declaration. And that behind the scenes at compile time will actually use one single try finally to handle all of your disposes. So if you have access to using the new language feature, then use that. All right. The other thing to keep in mind here, and this is specific to ADO.net, there's a close and there's a dispose. And if you remember, I was saying earlier about the TCP connection. This is a database TCP connection, of course. So when I say create a movie, it creates an instance of a connection and then it closes and disposes the connection and does that every time you create a movie, which is insane because that seems like it's a TCP connection and that's just going to cause you a lot of performance issues. But in AD.NET, if those who are interested in AD.NET, if, sorry, in AD.NET, there's a connection pool. So in your code, when your code manages or works with connections, and this happens behind the scenes for EF uh, Entity Framework as well, right? But if you're using it on net, then you need to be more aware of this. And the connection pool has the physical connection, if you will, the sockets that are managed, you know, et cetera, by the runtime. It's part of your application, though, this pool. And it's, it's the key of the pool is your connection string. So if your application is using one connection string for the whole application, then there's one. Think of it like a, like a dictionary. So there's one key that has many connections. That's the connection pool. And it establishes the connection with the physical, in this case, database. Your application, when it creates instances of connection here and says open connection, because it's using connections from the pool, it's not actually re-establishing a connection with the database. That TCP connection has been created or maintained and that actual socket is in the pool. So when you're saying open connection, you're simply retrieving first time, of course, it has to do the connection and establish the database connection and all that through the socket. After that, it's simply reusing that connection from the pool. However, to in order to release that pool connection back to the pool, you have to close your connection here. You're not closing the TCP connection, but close signals to the pool that you want to release that connection back to the pool. So that that same connection be reused by some other thing in your, in your code, right? So close and dispose and AD.NET connections are, have different meanings. Dispose is simply disposing of this DTO, if you will, your .NET side of things, not the unmanaged side, but the managed side of things, but the connection pool and all that is not being disposed. So hopefully that's making sense. The dispose and the naming conventions there in .NET also have were at some point established to mean certain things. When you're working with the file system, whether you close a file or dispose a file, it's the same thing. Right? The idea was that, or their thinking was, generally you open a file, so you close a file. You don't say open the file and dispose of a file. So the close method internal is doing the same thing as the dispose. And this applies for other things in .NET as well, except for radio.NET connections where the close and dispose are doing two different things. You can close and not dispose. If you close the ADU.NET connection, it's still going to release the connection, the pool connection back to the pool. You can continue to use your instance on your, in your machine, in your code here. You would still have to do an open and a close and an open and a close and an open and a close. Here I'm doing a create, open and a close. Right? So I'm saying create the connection, then open the connection, and then close the connection and dispose. So I couldn't, I don't have to do dispose here and I shouldn't then do the recreate here if, depending on the way I write my code, actually. But in this case, I do need to do it. All I'm going to get across is that the dispose, the close has to be called in the connection irrespective because this close will release the, if you're not disposing, the close has to be called. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe it's too much of a deviation. Okay, back to the other project where we're going to, going to talk about the logger now. Right? That's the next thing that is Let's say we're using for the first time, we say, oh, this logger um, is also disposable. What do we do about that? So, all right. So if I look at the logger provider here, of course, let's say we assume we made this class ourselves and we've done it, it's all kind of working. But if you look at this class now, you'll find that 
hey, this uh, logger factory is a disposable and this telemetry channel is a disposable. That means I somehow need to dispose this in this class, but these things need to be kept alive for the entire lifetime of the application, generally speaking, or you know, for the lifetime of this class, the actual logger provider. So how do you do that? Well, same thing. This logger provider needs to be an iDisposable. So let's implement that dispose method here. So it's there. And here we should be. So it's the same dispose pattern. And nothing is really changing except for what you do in the actual implementation of this dispose method. But I'm just going to go through the motions here. So, done the basic implementation, and let's look at this. I was saying the logger factory is a disposable, and so is the channel. And if you look at the sequence, we create a channel, and we create a logger factory. In this case, the channel and the logger factory are just not connected in any fashion, except here you can see that at some point, the logger factory is somehow indirectly being used to maintain that. So, anyway, this logger factory and the channel are both disposable. So we take the logger factory and we dispose that. So logger factory dot dispose. And the logger factory, just again to be sure, is actually not constructed in the constructor. No, it is. Okay. It is constructed. Okay. And then the telemetry channel. Now the telemetry channel is the key aspect here. Again, there's something you have to know about. So I can't really tell you that it's all known to you. You have to read the documentation. In the documentation, I can see that the telemetry channel first needs to be flushed and then needs to be disposed. Right? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm disposing of the factory. I flush the channel. Maybe I should, what I'd prefer to do is do this and actually do that. First flush the channel, then dispose and dispose. So that's my preference. And finally, set this to true. So, the dispose pattern or your implementation of dispose needs to be ad important as well. Ad important in this context means you should be able to call dispose multiple times without any problem. That, that's not to say you should be calling dispose or doing the disposing yourself all the time, but your implementation should be ad important. So if somebody calls your dispose method multiple times, you shouldn't throw an exception saying object already disposed or some thing like that. All right. So that's. Be aware of that as well, your implementation requirements. All right, so now that we have the logger provider <laughs> become disposed, the question is who's using this logger provider? Not just sitting here by itself, so who's creating it? Well, it turns out that the service locator is the one creating this logger provider. And it does that conditionally or only when this method is called. So in other words, it, this logger provider may be null. But because the service locator is creating an instance of it, right, actually creates an instance of it, it's the one that needs to be disposable now, because it's now hanging on to some disposable thing, and so it's responsibility to dispose this thing, but it can't do it by itself, since it doesn't have a dispose mechanism here, it needs to become I disposable, right, again, same thing applies, Right, so here we have this logger provider, but it may not be, it may not have been initialized. So here now, this is a valid scenario or case for when to use a question mark dot dispose, right? Because here you're saying this logger provider may not always be instantiated. It's possible that it's null, so conditionally to the dispose. So this is a valid scenario for using that null conditional operator. All right. Hopefully that distinction makes difference. This is a key thing for me. I just don't like because it makes it so convenient. People just start using it, using it. I think it's an abuse of this feature. So use it right or correctly rather than abusing it. And I think people will appreciate 
because you're thinking hard about your thing you're not just blindly being safe be safe be safe and without having to think about anything just always be safe that's not how you want to program ever program with intent show me your intent understand what you're doing so you can be telling me clearly through code what your intention is what do you understand is supposed to happen right all right so now <laughs> this service locator has been made i disposable who is using the service locator well, it turns out the manager is now the manager even though it didn't create the service locator is the one that gets an instance of it and because it got an instance of it at least in the way i design applications then this thing becomes responsible for it now luckily it's already an i disposable so basically the service locator here that we have and the private member needs to also be disposed here who got created first service locator got created first gateway got created next so gateway goes out first and so together comes in next. All right. Did you understand that? The order is reversed. So instance gets created first. In this case, it's created outside, but it's already here. This gets created next. Disposing happens in the reverse order. Gateway goes out first. So together goes out next. All right. There you have. So that's that. So far as all the implementations are concerned. If you run this application, The application should still be running. Right? But is the dispose happening? Put a breakpoint here. So in this case, let's put in the manager, let's actually go right to the bottom. So the gateway, this guy. Make sure his dispose method is being called here. And the logger provider, which is again the bottommost class here, that is doing the disposing. Let's put a big point here. Are these things being called? Now, if you're running this through your, your IS Express, it's not good. You're not going to have to, you won't have the option to see this happening because it's kind of happening outside in a different process. But if you run it as the sort of the console application, you should see it here. Let's verify. Remember, we've implemented and cascaded all the disposing. But if you're not actually calling the actual dispose on the domain facade anyway, the domain facade is registered with the IOC container, and the IOC container says, well, if I'm dealing with something that's disposable, when the entire application is shutting down, I will call dispose methods on all those things. And that's when the disposing starts to occur from the domain facade to the manager, to the, to the gateway, to HTTP client, or domain facade to the manager, to service locator, to logger provider, right? I'm going to shut down. Actually, I want to shut this down and do it from here. From the console. And just control C. Okay, there it is. Now we come in the gateway. You can see it's hit the breakpoint here. So this is being disposed. And here is the logger provider. That's also being disposed. So we have sort of confirmed that our entire call chain. This is important to do. Whenever you do this sort of thing, you want to make sure that you verify through test generally that this whole thing actually works the way it's expected. All right. Now, this has been just the web application. Next, we're moving on to a background service. Slightly different, slightly nuanced thing there. And that'll be interesting for those of you working with a background service. So I have a background service in my application here. Hosted services, I've got a background service. And this background service is just implementing, I'm implementing I hosted service directly myself, so I'm not relying on the pre-implemented worker service or whatever class. And this thing is using a timer, which is also an I disposable. And this service also requires a domain facade and a logger. All right, so it needs a domain facade and a logger. Again, I'm using dependency injection here only because it's part of the background service and it's I could create my domain facade instance here itself. Like I really don't care, but because I generally like my domain facade has to be a single instance across the entire application. It's a singleton. I'd rather have it injected here because it's already in the startup. Right? It's already been registered here in the startup. I could use that itself in the worker service itself. All right. The other thing is the logger. I don't have that here, so I'm going to figure out how to get our logger from the application logger to work here. And I also need to register the service, which I have not done yet. The, back, the worker service. And if you look at uh, programs, yes. Here. Say configure 
services, I believe. And that is services dot add add hosted service, right? And this is uh, the name of the service is uh, interval service, time interval service, All right? Okay, so now that we've added this hosted service to our uh, main host here, it'll get configured. Now, if we run it, it's going to complain saying, I don't know where the logger is, right? If I run this, it's going to need these arguments. It knows what the domain for that, it doesn't know what the logger is. This is the standard I logger. However, we want to use our, in this case, service locator get logger that gets that, that internally is using the logger providers. This, this is the logger we want, or in descendants. You want to make sure our background service also gets an I instance, I instance of I logger from our logger provider. All right, so here in the domain facade, we could add another singleton, but in this case, what are we registering? With that, the source locator is disposable. The I logger is just an I logger. But because the source locator has to create that logger provider that is disposable, the source locator also needs to be disposable, right? Now this source locator is outside of the domain facade. We are, we are creating an instance of a source locator all of our own. The one that's in the domain facade is separate. So when the domain facade gets disposed, it gets disposed. But for the worker service there, it's a separate thing. We don't have access to the Service locator that's internal to the domain facade. Now one could expose that, but I don't like to do that. And frankly, for the purposes of this discussion, just there are different things that occur, different scenarios that occur in real life. And so I want to, you to sort of think about how is this going to all work out? How, how would you implement it? So that's the reason here. So here, I'm, it's going to be a service locator. Uh, so service locator. And the service locator. Um, yes, you can register the source locator directly. However, we need that I logger. So I'm also going to register something that's an I logger. And I, if I don't need, I don't know if I need to say I logger, I'll figure that out. But here, we're going to use this implementation of logger implementation instance, right? This, this whole load here, because you can't see that. This one, most of so what's happening is because the service locator is the disposable, that needs to be registered here because it's going to be needing, it needs to be disposed at some point. So this logger is going to use that service locator. So I'm going to use this overload here, where it gets the service provider and the logger, returns the logger instance, right? Okay. So it gets a uh, service provider. So service provider dot uh, get required service. And the required service I need is the service locator, right? The service locator then has a method called get logger. Logger. And that is what we need to return here. All right? So the I'm using this service locator. Retrieving it over here, it's been registered, so I can retrieve it here, I get that instance. And then that's the one that creates the logger and that returns the sign logger here. But because both of these are disposables and they're registered with the IRC container, they will be disposed of by the IRC container as we saw before, that the domain facade was called, domain facade's dispose method was called when we shut down the application that then sent off this chain reaction of going all the way down to the logger provider and the gateway. So for the source locator, same thing is going to occur. It's going to, this dispose method will be called, which will dispose of the logger provider that's intrinsic to this instance of source locator, right? And this logger, I logger, we don't actually need to um, dispose of it because it's just a I logger, it's not a disposable. All right, so now this service timer interval service will get called. So effectively, 
what I'm saying is that this logger provider, this post method should be called twice now. Once because of the domain facade that houses its own service locator that houses its own logger provider. And this service locator, when it gets disposed, it should dispose of the logger provider, but that's another instance of a logger provider. Right? So that logger providers dispose method should be called twice now. Let's try that. It's of course because we've already registered the worker service, the background service. It's going to start this up. And if it starts this up, let's make sure we get that here. I'm just going to put a breakpoint here and make sure it comes in here. All right. All right. Okay. So it started. Both of these are instantiated. This is the same instance of the domain facade, but this logger came from a different service locator. So therefore, that service, there are two service locators that will be disposed, and so that dispose method should be called twice. And that's the theory. All right, app collection is working. Let's go to this console and shut down. This come once, run, come twice. See that? It's come in twice. Run. Now this is. Oh, sorry, that was a gateway. This is the provider. Let's do it again. Let me we take out the gateways. Don't get confused. We only have a big point in the logger provider. Okay, let's starting up. Okay, let's get to the console. Okay, just come here once. It run. Let's come here twice. And that's that. So let's come twice. That has verified that. This timer here, final thing. This timer is also disposable. So now we need to implement I disposable here. But the timer also implements uh, something called dispose async. Oops, let me show you here. Dispose async. And this dispose async is, is I async disposable, I believe it is the interface. I async dispose. So let's implement that here. So I async disposable. And it has a method of its own. That's the return of the value task instead of a task and say, of course, it's a async. So here uh, we have to ST. Mark it as async and timer dot again. Is do we need a question mark dot? Of course not. Well, when do we create an instance? When we start it up, yes. So the timer may be not instantiated because it's not being done in the constructor. So we do need to say question mark dot here, dispose async, and of course, await this. Right. And this would be implemented. In the same manner, this is sort of the, the public version of the method that calls a private method and so on and so forth. And GC to suppress file and all of that is the same. Okay, so hopefully this has been useful. You guys have learned a few things. If you have, please give me a thumbs up and I will see you next time.